Uh, the next item and last item on our, our, on our agenda is the uh, investment strategy informational session. Um, let me start off by thanking uh, the two subject matter experts that will be joining us as, as well as the staff members who will be presenting. Uh, the Board of Regents continuously hears various perspectives on important topics that are, that are of impact to our university. And in particular, we've listened to the to public comment from individuals and groups as it relates to our investment strategy. And today the Finance Committee is looking forward to hearing from different perspectives that will be presented. But I think it's important to note that our investment strategy is only one part of our overall commitment to sustainability, uh, which includes green building and sustainable options and things like that. So um, I'd like to thank everyone who has also submitted public comments. Um, every Anyone who might be listening or who'd still like to submit written public comments can uh, do so by following the directions posted on board docs uh, for this meeting. And uh, written public comment has been available on this topic for the past few days, and it'll close by the end of the day. Uh, the, the public comment will be posted um, on board docs in the coming days, whatever we, we receive up until now. Um, and of course, we've all probably received emails um, about this as well, uh, leading up to today's conversation. So with that, I'll uh, turn it over to Chad. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm gonna just talk through how we're planning to proceed through these items, because we have, we have different parts. So um, we're gonna have four segments. Uh, the first will be a presentation from Treasurer Sharma and Treasurer Emeritus Wilson, just providing an overview of CU's investment strategy and relevant policies. Um, the second, um, a presentation from one of our subject matter experts, the Director of Financial Analysis, for the Institute of Energy Economics and Financial Analysis, Tom Sanzillo. Um, third will be a presentation from the Vice President of Public Policy at C3 Solutions, uh, Mr. Nick Loris. And then fourth, a presentation from my, myself actually summarizing CU's other sustainability efforts. Um, this is scheduled to be around an hour long informational session and we wanna be respectful of everyone's time. So we're aiming to have each one of those four segments last no more than 15 minutes. So the board staff will be including a clock on the screen for each segment so we can stay on track with the meeting. Um, we'd also, if, um, if, if possible, try to hold questions from the board members until the end of the presentations so that we can um, have that conversation amongst all the presenters. Um, and with that, I'd like to turn it over to the first presentation from Treasurer Sharma and Treasurer Emeritus and consultant Dan Wilson. Well, great. Um, you guys can't get rid of me. I'm a Meredith squared, by the way. <laughs> um, so, um, Usha and I will kind of share this presentation and, you know, you have to always start out with one of my hike pictures. This is like Isabel in Indian Peaks Wilderness. The goal. Hey, uh, hey Dan, let me just stop you real quick. Amber, you have your hand up. Were you wanting to jump in real quick? No, so that's just so that it like puts the clock in right up in the corner okay. so everyone can see it. Go ahead. Got it. Okay, sorry, Dan. Go ahead. No, no problem. So we have our goals uh, for today are, you know, to talk about how Treasury is involved in our commitment to sustainability. Uh, we want to talk about how CU's investment returns are used. And we want to talk a little bit about our assets and how we manage those consistent with state law and region policy, and some of the objectives that are in those particular documents of law and policy. We're gonna dive into a little bit about our investment strategies, and then uh, share our percentage of holdings in the energy sector and in sustainability assets. So the first thing I wanna talk about is our treasury's commitment to sustainability and two areas of responsibility that treasury has, which are investments and debt. Uh, first I'll note that 
uh, sustainable funds, green funds like solar or wind power are among the assets which CU managers can invest in. And for equity funds, the, the mutual fund team of investors is responsible for the companies they pick to hold in their fund. Um, in the second bullet, I wanna you know, switch from the investment side to talk about debt, which the treasury office manages. And um, we're responsible to issue debt for all of the four campuses as they need it for projects. And in the last six years, uh, we have issued 466 million or about a fourth of our existing outstanding debt as green bonds. And these are sold in the market where, where we can market them as green because of the underlying project which is being built is either a gold or lead certified uh, project. And those certifications uh, are, are met when standards uh, with regard to that construction and, and to the energy use for the new building are, are uh, accumulated. And we, you know, there's a, a, a whole list of things that have to be done to meet those standards. And CU now has about 60 buildings now with LEED certification with, with more plans. As we uh, work with our investment advisors and our committee, we survey all asset classes in this asset allocation process. And on an annual basis, Treasury, along with our outside uh, consultant investment advisor, Callan, we conduct an annual due diligence on all our investment managers, their philosophies, their processes, their ESG considerations, performance, et cetera. And uh, finally, um, we always invest solely for the benefit of the university. Thank you, I'll take it from here. So just building on that last bullet from the previous slide. So the CUG investment activities or the returns are used solely for the benefit of the university community. Some of the examples that these investment returns contribute to are student scholarships and grants, uh, faculty projects and research, facilities maintenance and facility upgrades, and special projects. Those are the items that, some of the items that the investment returns fund. So talking about the governance aspect of the treasury pool investments, um, the treasurer has been delegated the authority to manage and invest financial assets of the university by the Board of Regents within a set of region policies and state law. And below are some of the examples of those state law, the prudent invest, investment acts. While the region policy 13A is a separate governing document from the state law, the key objectives are the guidelines um, of the policy aligned with state law requirements. In the following slides, I will cover some of the objectives or guidelines of these documents and how we comply with these objectives or guidelines in investing universities' funds. So the key objectives of the state law and region policy when it comes to the investment of universities' financial assets are to ensure that these funds are invested for the sole benefit of the university, achieving broad diversification by asset class, sector, and issuer in order to minimize risk and maximize return. In essence, investment goals and strategies should be developed in such a way that the investment portfolio, portfolio can weather all market cycles. As mentioned before, investment strategy is determined in collaboration with investment experts and in context of the overall portfolio. And one important point to note, um, Colorado's law does not allow public entities, including CU to one individual corporate stocks or partnerships. Next one, please. So this slide really talks about how we comply with these guidelines and objectives. So let's look at how we are, we are um, complying. First of all, with the authority from the regions to manage financial assets of the university, 
the treasurer is a bonded fiduciary of the university and by that virtue is held to the strict standard of a prudent investor. The treasurer does not solely determine investment goals and strategies. They are determined in collaboration with the investment advisory committee, which consists of investment experts within and outside of the university, including a representative from the board of regent who chairs the committee. In this case, it's regent Montera who chairs investment advisory committee. In addition, university also retains an external investment advisory form, which assists in developing investment strategy and asset allocation. Finally, as I mentioned before, CU cannot invest in individual stocks or partnerships. The treasury pool investments are in mutual funds and separately managed accounts, which are actively managed by ex external parties. We will, with this, I'm going to hand it off to Dan again. Yeah, uh, Regent Materi, did you wanna say anything? Um, with regard to your involvement in, in our advisory committee? Well, maybe just to clarify that a little bit, although I'm considered the chair of that advisory committee, it is an advisory committee, a group of people with significant expertise in um, uh, financial management that do make recommendations to that committee and set a strategy. But it is a committee that advises. Is It is not a committee that dictates or makes those determinations independently. Thank you, appreciate that. So as we follow regent policy and state law, this slide is a list of the selection criteria that we consider as we pick funds and managers and that in turn select the underlying company stocks to buy and sell in the, in the treasury pool uh, or bonds as the, in the case of bond managers. And I, I'm not going to go through in detail each of these criteria, but we've tried to put the more important ones at the top of the slide, and I'm going to go through the, the first three of those. So the first thing we do is we seek to have a portfolio that is balanced between risk, liquidity, and return. And when I use that word liquidity, it means how uh, what's what's the ability to turn that asset into spendable cash? Uh, and on, when I use return, we're talking about the income of that asset. What kind of distributions of uh, either dividends, capital gains, or interest does it have? Um, generally, when you take more risk, uh, you would expect a greater return. But we have to balance that with the need for spendable cash to support the day-to-day -day cash spending of the university and, and in particular, very important monthly distributions of payroll. Second um, bullet point here is we, we want a diversified portfolio by asset class, by sector, by issuer. Uh, we don't uh, currently have any filter out of to filter out any class of assets. And we try to balance uh, holdings and fixed income uh, and, and to have bonds as well. So we have an all weather portfolio that can function well in most economic conditions. Um, usually when the market is down, bonds can be up. Now we saw in 22 that didn't work out so well, everything was down. but. Generally, it's a pretty good all-weather portfolio. And we rely on external managers to help make the best selection of assets to hold to achieve those objectives. Uh, third, uh, we select managers based on their investment style. Uh, a manager who selects stock based on their growth potential is generally paired with a manager that selects based on their value. And these styles perform generally contrary to each other, but together they can outperform the ben benchmarks we use uh, to com compare with. So uh, there's a other criteria here, which we consider team size, their experience, their internal controls, their long-term performance uh, when we pick managers. And this, this process usually takes six to 12 months depending on whether we do a formal RFP or not. 
No, I'll just point out the last one on here is fees. It's important uh, we look at the fees because we try to minimize fees as they reduce the return. And our investment advisor, Callan, uh, plays a very important role in this selection process, as does our advisory committee. Uh, next slide. So this slide just shows uh, our treasury balance as of our fiscal year end, June 30th, 2023. 20, uh, and uh, not to be confused with the August 31st numbers that Usha sh showed. So if you look at the upper right corner of this slide, you'll see our, our assets listed by asset class. Um, asset classes A, B, and C, which are daily cash, uh, something we call enhanced cash and short-term fixed income. Those assets support our paying of bills on a daily basis and they support payroll, which represents uh, nearly 70% of our outgoing cash. Uh, categories D through H, which includes uh, long-term fixed income and our equities, these are part of the campus and system reserves that are set aside to support future needs and priorities of the university's operation. Um, all of these numbers are in millions. So uh, when you see the number 598 for cash, that's 598 million as of June 30th. And the total market value of these investments was 3.1 billion, which is a slight increase over the prior year. And Dan, I just want to remind you, you got about a mi minute and 45. Okay, well, I'm going to hurry. They, uh, and then we, we show benchmarks. Uh, the pull returns are, uh, are shown there against quarters, months, and years, and year to date. And uh, we're at 9% for uh, last year compared to a benchmark of 7.58. And the pie chart is a representation of these asset categories in the upper table. I'm just going to highlight the gold and the gray. The gold is a domestic equity. And in that space, we hold mutual funds, largely in the United States. Uh, we hold those in small cap, which is up to 2 billion. And we have a growth and value style. And mid cap, which is 2 to 10 billion, which is, again, growth and value styles. And then we index in our uh, large cap space. And we do similar. Uh, pairing in uh, international and global equities. Uh, and then the last slide here is, this slide was prepared with the help of Callan, represents the last four fiscal years, the share of our pool in the energy sector. In the last two years, we've been tracking our share of companies that comprise the global sustainable leaders as identified by S&P Global through corporate sustainability assessment. And this process selects the top 10% of the largest 2,500 companies based on long-term economic environment and social criteria. The energy sector, as you can see, has fluctuated between 2.5% low in FY19 and 4.5% in FY22, where we had a, a very good return year for the energy sector. Uh, and our um, our end of the year energy sector is three percent, and we have six percent in the Sustainable World Index at June 30. All of these percentages are based on CU's investments in mutual funds, as well as in our fixed income holding managers. And we uh, we do not make any of these company selections in Treasury or with our our team, but but through the managers we hired. And we, we have said this a number of times, but we have no direct holdings in any company per state statute. And what we're trying to do with our portfolio is to minimize risk and maximize returns to promote the stability of funding for CU's spending priorities. That's, and that's it. Sorry, I went over it. 30 seconds. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. Thank you, I Dan. Get, I get a, a, a demerit. <laughs> <laughs> we'll subtract uh, 30 seconds from your next presentation. Okay. It's a deal. Go ahead, Chad. You're... I think... Well, 
And so, maybe you want to present the next or introduce the next presenters. Yeah. So we are very grateful to have um, two outside presenters here. Um, the first one is Tom Zanzillo, who's the director uh, of financial analysis for the Institute of Energy Economics and Financial Analysis. He has produced uh, influential studies on oil and gas, petrol and coal sectors in the US and internationally, including company and credit analysis, uh, facility de development, oil and gas reserves, stock and commodity market analysis, and public and private financial structures. He examines uh, such areas as community and shareholder activism, institutional investment, public subsidies and Puerto Rico's energy economics. With a wide experience in public policy, regulation, budget planning and government operations, uh, Tom has testified as an expert witness, hot energy finance, spoken at major conferences and events, and is frequently quoted in leading business and broadcast media. He also has 17 years of experience with the city and state of New York in senior financial and policy management positions. As the uh, first deputy controller of the state of New York, he oversaw the finances of 1,300 units of local government, uh, the annual management of 44,000 government contracts, that's a lot, and over 2 billion, 200 billion in state and local municipal bond programs, as well as 156 billion global pension fund and administration of a 1 million member retirement system. So. Tom, thank you very much for joining us, and the time is yours. Yeah, oh, thank you for um, <clears throat> inviting me. Um, uh, put this on, and um, um, my, uh, I was um, glad to see the last budget presentation because I, I having spent a lot of time in government, I um, understand that the. Um, achieving the kind of uh, success that you've achieved in the in the financial, it doesn't come easy and, and, and it requires attention to every little detail. Um, and that's what I, I wanna to try to do here with you today is to talk about the financial case of divestment and why um, uh, many funds are moving uh, towards it. Um, and um, just to let you know where my organization is in, been doing this kind of work. Uh, I've been doing it for about almost 20 years and uh, the other, um, we've um, been doing this as an organization for about 10 and we're in 30 countries um, looking to work um, on uh, fossil fuels and alternatives and sustainability. Next slide, please. Um, what, what I want to do is sort of, because there's a lot of execution questions and you're a lot of you are practitioners, uh, I wanted to start for a minute uh, just to talk about what this is. Um, divestment really is asking of, of um, um, uh, fund and managers and fund uh, fiduciaries to look at um, ridding themselves of one way or another of some level of fossil fuels, and I'll get to that in, more in a minute, or restricting new investments, always meeting your return targets and doing what Dan said of minimizing your fees through diligence. It's a defensive measure to protect you against losses. That's what it is. Next slide, please. Um, 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 many funds have been doing this for the last 10 years. Um, it's now up to about 40 trillion where funds are taking one form or another of divestment depending on their philosophy and the perspective of the fiduciaries who run the funds. Next slide. Started off small, little university funds, churches. It's now grown. Next slide, please. The New York State Common Retirement Fund is the fund I was in, in charge of for many years. Um, the University of Maine, very tiny fund, um, um, has uh, moved towards it. Next slide, please. Many uh, insurance companies, pension funds, universities, asset managers like um, BlackRock, who advised the city of New York, um, and I'll talk a little bit about what their studies were showing, 
because they did surveys of um, uh, detailed surveys of funds that had divested them where they came up on fees and returns. Um, next slide, please. And the reason for the argument is a financial reason in that the energy sector over the last uh, oh, 10 years or so um, has been in trouble and it remains in trouble and it looks like it will continue um, um, going forward as a negative outlook. Um, we've seen some recent uptick from the um, intervention of uh, uh, Russia into Ukraine, which caused a spike in the prices. Next slide, please. Um, but you'll see that over time, um, the industry is going, um, is um, losing market share. And what this chart shows you is that in 1980, um, which is what I think most of us think about when we think about the oil and gas industry, they were 30% of this, of the Standard & Poor's 500. Today, they are 4.7% of the Standard & Poor's. And before Vladimir Putin invaded the Ukraine, they were, it was at 2%. And there was an uptick in the market from that invasion and, uh, and the, and the um, disruption that that caused in the markets. Next slide, please. What this one shows is it goes back into the, um, into the 90s, this, the, um, the, this, the uh, circle there um, shows the, where the um, energy sector, the blue line, actually drove returns, the financial returns um, all over the world. And they did that for quite some time. And they were number one in the markets. And they made a major contribution to the kinds of funds that I've managed. In fact, I uh, was a um, significant, my fund was a significant beneficiary of the fossil fuel sector for many years. As you can see, that no longer is the case. The blue line now represents the um, energy sector. And the pink line represents the Standard & Poor's 500. Next slide, please. This is another way of saying the same thing. Uh, the green box is the energy sector and all the other boxes are the other sectors in the Standard & Poor's 500. Leading up to um, 2021, um, you have a, um, you can look at the bottom and you see that in five of the 10 years, the sector was in last place and in eight of the 10 years, it was below lagging the market as opposed to what I was showing you before where they were dominating the market. Then with Putin and the end of the pandemic, you have two years of, um, of, um, uh, of uh, positive returns um, and you now are back lagging the market. Next slide. And when they were able to, when Putin did inv invade, this is what that red line is the energy sector and the rest of the economy um, in 2022 um, didn't do very well. Um, and that's what happened when that invasion took place in the markets. Next slide. Come 2023, as the markets start to absorb it, the energy sector winds up where? Last place again. Why is that? And now they're doing slightly better in the last couple of months, but they're still lagging the market as they have for the last 10 years. Why is that happening? Next slide. It's happening for three basic reasons. Um, we're seeing um, um, changes in competition, which I'll go into in a minute. And we're seeing um, competition among governments as well as market competition that the industry has never seen before. And so over that 10 year period, this chart shows you that the energy sector, it's another way of showing you the same thing. The energy sector has underperformed the markets for a decade. And this is even with the Putin bump. This is their accumulative uh, chart. Next slide, please. This is another way of looking at it where the MSCI index of fossil fuel the, the, um, the uh, all country world index is compared against the all country world index without fossil fuels. It's a mirror fund. 
Um, so what you have over the over the period from 2010 to the present is the um, MSCI excluding fossil fuels is um, doing slightly better, but obviously not worse, which is what many people will tell you. Next slide, please. As I said, the reason for this is competition, competition among the producers. Most of the producers for fossil fuels and oil and gas in the world are state-owned enterprises like Russia, Saudi Arabia, Norway, and, uh, and uh, many others. Um, and they have um, um, been in the last 10 years competing against each other in new and different ways, partly because of the United States um, producers who were able to increase production considerably because of fracking, which you may have heard of, um, that has catapulted the United States um, producers um, to number one in the world, which has caused a whole lot of competitive pressures, um, and particularly among with Russia and Saudi Arabia. And, and we see a lot of the political tumult as a result of that. But you're also seeing more importantly, the market forces. Next slide, please. That was uh, the governmental one. The next one is I think uh, more important for the markets uh, and looking at the outlook. Next slide, please. The energy sector has three uh, parts, transport, electric, and petrochemicals in each of those sectors, uh, they are losing market share and they don't have a plan moving forward um, to um, absorb the, or, uh, or make up that market share. That's why they went from 30% down to where they are now. They are losing out to competition where they traditionally have had a monopoly. Next slide, please. So, are they prepared um, to meet this? And this is when I was talking before, when BlackRock did its study for the city of New York, it looked at the transition and whether or not the companies, the oil and gas companies were uh, capable of handling the competition going forward. And they determined um, that they weren't. And most of the funds that have now opted to move out of uh, 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 fossil fuels in one way or another have come to that conclusion that they don't have a transition plan. And we do um, analysis all over the world on this. And I would be more than willing to go through with you in great detail. But their major premise, the oil and gas industry's major premise, is they have a few technological um, um, items and they're um, um, right now not commercially uh, possible to do. And so there's a lot of different ways that they're trying to do investments and get public subsidies and what have you. But right now they don't have a plan. Next slide, please. Um, the one major one is called carbon capture and sequestration. We've analyzed this um, all over the world and, we're see and we have engineers and we have scientists and we have um, people who are, who are capable of looking at the energy side. The United States government accounting office has been looking at, uh, accountability office has been looking at this for 30 years and has yet to find a project that they have found worthwhile. This is the major um, investment strategy of the industry going forward, which is why we see a negative outlook Next slide, please. The money that's being invested um, going forward, they're not moving into um, uh, new areas that are sustainable. This is showing that a lot of the money now is going back to shareholders, probably where it should be if they're not going to be investing. But most of the money still remains in traditional oil and gas, um, partially because there still is some profit there, but it's very volatile. It's a, high, it's a much more speculative stock, not the blue chip stock that we're all familiar with over many years. So I ask, next slide, please. And so um, we just look at this and say the um, past is, under, is showing dramatic underperformance, not anything like it used to be. There's competition in the market and amongst the countries. There's no promising innovations going forward. And so there are many places that are looking to do this divestment. I wanna end on one thing as a public official now, to you as public officials. Um, this is not fun, what we, you're being asked to do. Um, the, um, you're being asked to ask the right questions. That's what a fiduciary does. Um, and you have to ask the right questions and you have to make an independent decision as fiduciaries about what to do here. 
it's not your um, advisors per se who can really make this one for you. You have to do it yourself. You also have another function, a leadership function as university leaders. And that means you don't get to choose whether or not you're gonna do something on climate change or not and how you're gonna deal with it. Because as a person who was in government for a long time, I didn't get to choose the issues either. And I would much prefer not having to deal with climate change when I was managing a pension fund. And I would imagine that you don't wanna do it either. And I don't blame you because it's too darn hard um, to do it. But that's what we have and that's the cards that have been dealt. The university obviously has another responsibility to its students and as leaders, you're obviously an example to them as to how this gets remedied and how, what steps are taken um, um, to address this issue. Um, and so I leave you with the one question that I would ask you to ask your advisors. Um, and that is, um, what would your profile look, your, your, uh, your investment profile look like if it was designed to meet targets and divest. Thanks. Minute, I got, I got, got you a minute back. <laughs> you did. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Tom, for your preparation and, and presentation. Um, uh, I'd like to introduce now uh, Nick Loris, who is the Vice President of Public Policy at C3 Solutions. Uh, Loris studies and writes about a wide range of energy and climate policies, including natural resource extraction, energy subsidies, nuclear energy, renewable power, and energy efficiency. He also studies ways in which markets will improve the environment, reduce emissions, and strengthen climate resiliency. He uh, testifies regularly before House and Senate committees on a variety of energy and environmental issues, most recently on the importance of critical minerals for clean energy technologies and on the economic impact of wildfires. Uh, he received his master's degree in economics from George Mason University in Virginia and holds a bachelor's degree in economics, finance, and political science from Albright College in Pennsylvania. Uh, he serves as senior advisor on the energy and, and environment at Matris LLC and serves on various policy advisory boards, including the American Conservation Coalition. Uh, Nick, we'll turn it over to you, and I and I think you're going to show your own slides. I think that's right. Um, I don't see a share button on this Zoom, though. Um, I'm happy to share for you if you'd like, Nick. I have them ready to go. Yeah, that's easier. Um, that's totally fine okay. by me. Um, and as we're pulling those up, um, just to give you a, a little bit of background, uh, C3 Solutions stands for the Conservative Coalition for Climate Solutions. We are a public policy shop in Washington, D.C., um, focusing on energy, uh, climate, and environmental policy. Uh, we've been around for a little more than three years now. Um, we work across the ideological and political spectrum to come up with evidence-based solutions on meeting our energy needs and climate ambitions. So to the extent anyone wants to talk about those things at a later date, I'd, I'd love to chat about them. Um, with respect to today's topic, it, it's clear that fossil fuel divestment is gaining momentum as indicated by the number of institutions and the dollar amounts committed to a full or partial divestment. And with my time today, I'd like to make uh, four brief points. Uh, next slide, please. The first is to examine the effectiveness of divestment, both from an impact on fossil fuels companies' financial well-being and influence from an impact on climate goals and global decarbonization. Uh, I think that there's a good reason why Adam Aston, who's a senior writer for greenbiz.com, called divestment ineffective at best and counterproductive at worst. And why is it ineffective? You know, Getting rid of any of these stocks, bonds, or investment funds is simply going to open opportunities for others to scoop them up. Uh, as I mentioned in a previous talk on this topic, it's like dropping $100 on the ground and expecting that no one will pick it up. And if there is a larger coordinated divestment that depresses the price of these stocks, it's only going to make it a bargain 
and a bargain for investors who more likely care less about the environmental and social returns, uh, which I'll return to in a minute. And the study that I mentioned down here at the bottom examined uh, the ineffectiveness, and this is from the National Bureau of Economic Research. Um, two researchers, from uh, one from Stanford, one from Penn, looked at the impact of divestment. Um, I don't, sorry, I just saw a request to turn on my camera. I don't see that as possible. Um, sorry. That on the bottom usually, Nick. Yeah, I, I only see the microphone. Um, no, I guess you keep going. Okay. I'll just keep going. Sorry about that. Um, anyway, this study looked um, at the impact of divestment and came to the conclusion uh, that uh, it had negligible impacts on investment decisions from these firms, uh, even under the most optimistic scenarios, um, to affect a more than 1% change in the cost of capital impact investors would need to make up more than 80% of all investable wealth. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, consequently, uh, divestment would also be uh, negligible from an impact on uh, CO2 emissions and greenhouse gas emissions. Um, there's research uh, that I point to here, two scholars from the Political Economy Research Institute at the University of uh, Massachusetts Am Amherst found that while divestment did help mobilize the negative public perception of fossil fuel companies, uh, it would be financially and climatically ineffective. And importantly, the study noted that divestment was unlikely to become more effective over time. And I think that's why you, you have prominent folks, scholars and investors, you know, the Bill Gates of the world, the Robert Stavens at Harvard, uh, the lot, he's a leading scholar at the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, um, who care deeply about climate change, arguing that the emissions impact of divestment is trivial. Um, th so that's the ineffective part. The second point I'd like to make is on divestments counterproductivity. Uh, next slide, please. One counterproductive outcome uh, is that it could reduce the ability to engage directly and influence the behavior of these companies. You know, one of the major perks of being a shareholder is that it gives you a voice in the company and a more productive use of efforts could be to pressure your asset managers to engage with these companies. And I know that CU's endowment does not hold individual stocks in companies and you know, those with a stake in mutual funds and exchange traded funds and pension plans, things like that, can't directly vote in a policy and boardroom fights. But fund managers and investment firms are getting more aggressive. Uh, you know, that's the position that engine number one has taken and we're instrumental in getting more climate conscious members on Exxon's board. Uh, next slide, please. One recent case study actually looked at this uh, debate of divestment versus engagement, uh, comparing Harvard's divestment strategy from engine number one's engagement strategy. Uh, they showed that Harvard's endowment underperformed from fiscal year 21 to fiscal year 22 and cited the absence of a strong oil and gas sector and lack of diversification as reasons why. And um, engine number one's battle to uh, have this fight on the board certainly came at a cost. They spent tens of millions of dollars on it. But... I do believe it's led to some significant changes uh, in the company's portfolio and a, a stronger commitment to be net zero by the year 2050. And I understand that the sentiment of advocates of divestment may want these companies to, to go away entirely and fossil fuels to be shrunken down to zero. But um, to the extent that you can engage these companies seriously about sound investments in low carbon technologies, sequestration, direct air capture, and other legitimate decarbonization, as opposed to greenwashing, I think that's a meaningful step in, in the right direction. And, and Robert Stavens, who I mentioned earlier, is someone who sees uh, natural gas as a, a, a transition fuel, fuel still, um, something to uh, continue to back up wind and solar as uh, battery storage becomes more economical, uh, something that's helped reduce the emissions here in the United States as we switched from uh, coal to natural gas. And with more than 90% of future emissions coming from the developing world, uh, a belief that natural gas is going to play an important role as a transition fuel. Um, and then just real quickly, another um, 
another potential counterproductive outcome is who the buyers are. Um, shifting from private equity or to state ownership um, could result in less transparency um, and, and disclosure. Um, and of course, there's the opportunity cost. Um, one of the conclusions that the Political Economy Research Institute paper that I mentioned, and it's a conclusion that's been drawn by others, is that this money and resources could be better spent on more direct efforts to drive down fossil fuel consumption and therefore have more of a climate impact on CO2 emissions. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the third point I would like to make is with regard to the potential losses and costs of divestment. Um, the reality is that I don't know if financial divestment is a financially prudent decision. If I did, I probably wouldn't be working uh, at a think tank trying to fix permitting delays for clean energy projects and talking about forest management. Um, and I, I believe that the evidence that I've seen on uh, the pain that divestment can cause investors has been mixed. Uh, you know, there's been uh, long-term declines in the oil and gas sectors that have meant over the past, you know, decade plus that divestments have not always dented returns. Um, and in the most recent report from Divest Invest Network, they compared the S&P 500 index uh, with and without the uh, inclusion of fossil fuels. And uh, between 2012 and 2021, found that the fossil-free one outperformed the former. Um, we've seen ESG funds consistently rank around the middle of their peer groups, sometimes a little below, sometimes uh, a little above. Um, and yet other funds have said that divesting from these sectors has cost them over time. Uh, and certainly you've seen a blip uh, as a result of Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the energy prices leading to a rally of many of these energy stocks, which uh, you know I think has certainly changed the calculation for the the short term at least, and, and potentially longer than that. Uh, next slide, please. I think e even in the most recent uh, year, we've seen a number of investors talk differently about um, oil and gas and the importance of oil and gas in meeting future energy demands. Uh, it was in Larry Fink's letter to investors this year. I, I think this second story for in Bloomberg um, it is quite telling. It's about an investor, James Jampel, who uh, made his name shorting oil stocks, um, but he called oil stocks the biggest dead cat bounce in history, uh, and noting that the green stocks are getting pummeled by a, a combination of higher bar borrowing costs and supply chain bottlenecks, which is something that the oil and gas industry is, is grappling with as well. And, and Jampel's quote, again, I think it is telling when he says he believes that new energy uh, is going to be the play as comp compared to fossil energy, but predicting that in the shorter medium term is extremely difficult, which to, to Tom's point is why I do not envy uh, the task that you uh, are given in making that happen. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, one other uh, simple note is you know looking at energy trading at the lowest price to earnings valuation of any sector in the S&P 500, according to this data uh, compiled by Bloomberg and also generating the most cash flow per share. Uh, and next slide, please. Now, I do want to warn of some of the potential costs to universities um, with regard to debt investment. And again, I'm saying this as someone with a lot of humility as to not knowing what's going to happen. Um, and again, underscoring that if I did, I wouldn't be in a policy role. Uh, but I do believe you know, in the Finance 101 mantra that tells us that portfolio diversification is a, a prudent strategy. And the reality is of the 10 major industry sectors in the U.S. equity markets, energy has the lowest correlation with all of the others, which means it has the largest potential diversification benefit. And the sector with the second lowest correlation with others is utilities, which also is the target uh, of many fossil fuel divestment strategies. And the economist who pointed this out is Daniel Fischel at the University of Chicago, who analyzed the performance of two hypothetical portfolios over a 50-year period, one with fossil energy stocks and the other without, and found that the portfolio with the energy stocks had annual average returns 0.7 points less than the one with fossil fuels. Um, if you look at those losses among all universities, you're talking about estimates of uh, $3.2 billion dollars uh, per year for all university endowment portfolios. And the other thing, interesting point about Fischl's research, along with other fund managers and universities and analysts, um, are the higher management fees associated with keeping investments fossil-free, particularly because it's such 
a complicated task. Uh, and the, um, the other citation there uh, from Arizona State Professor Henrik Bessenbinder similarly found high costs of, bear, of um, carrying out the divestment and also managing the divestment um, could cost the university's endowment up to 12% of its total endowment over a period of two decades. And a big part of that cost and challenge is, is simply understanding the complication and sometimes vagueness of what divestment looks like. Um, if you're holding mutual funds, co-mingled funds, private equity funds, it's difficult to get rid of just your oil and gas holdings and therefore the transaction cost can be quite high. Uh, if you extend that into the discussion of the banks lending to oil and gas companies, um, things, you know, it gets even arguably higher. And I think that's why you see um, folks like CalPERS, arguably the most progressive state in, in the country fighting back against divestment. And you had uh, quotes from the California State Teachers Retirement System saying, this is going to make it harder for us to achieve the returns we need to pay the benefits for our teachers of California. Um, and then again, there's an opportunity cost here that the, the financial losses could be potentially hundreds of millions of dollars that could be invested back into the university to current and future students toward enhancing climate and research programs or to continuing to make the campus net zero and as sustainable as possible. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and I'll just close by saying this, uh, you know, there's been a lot of talk about peak oil and demand in the, in recent years, potential for stranded assets, high cop capital costs for conventional energy resources. And I'm not denying those are um, real possibilities, but I do know that the world's going to need a, a lot more energy moving forward. Um, and I think we need to be conscious about the energy that we need to provide to not deprive the world of affordable, reliable power while also meeting our decarbonization efforts. Um, we've got three quarters of a billion people without access to electricity. Uh, Americans use more energy to heat their swimming pools than several African nations combined. And where we have the most energy poverty in places like Asia and Africa, you know, their populations are, are set to double in the next few decades. Uh, so I think instead of an energy transition, um, which I think is going to happen and is encouraging for many reasons, uh, next slide please. Uh, I do think it's going to be, sorry, could you do one more, please? Uh, I do think you are going to see a, a little bit of all of the above. Um, it is encouraging that renewables are cost competitive, that there's more investment in the energy transition, um, but there's still uh, a, a lot of investment going into uh, fossil fuels, even with the carrots and sticks pushing for energy transitions. I think the most likely uh, scenarios still have the U.S., and the world using a lot of natural gas and a lot of oil. Uh, next slide, please. Um, sorry, can you do one more? Maybe two more. One more, please. Uh, yeah, this I think would just be a good resource for folks if they're looking at different energy scenarios moving forward. The resources for the future compiled a list of different scenarios. Um, the Energy Information Administration is recently out with their uh, latest um, scenario today. And again, they do show that there's going to be um, greater growth in non-fossil fuel sources, but the increased demand for energy and current policies, we're still going to see a, a lot of growth in fossil energy as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to Tom and thank you to Nick. I'm gonna I'm gonna round out the presentations and and do a little bit of overview of just to use other sustainability efforts to just give a sense of that. Um, Dan had mentioned a couple of them that were tied to treasury efforts related to financing, um, but I'm gonna talk about some of those overall um, things that the university is doing. So if we go to the next slide, um, one thing that is good to remind everybody about is that the board has its CU strategic plan. And the state CU strategic plan has a component part in the fiscal strength pillar tied to sustainability. And that includes measuring um, energy use intensity, greenhouse gas emissions, as well as our facility condition index. And we have 2026 goals in that space. And we report annually in terms of our progress towards goal in those. If we go to the next slide, we can look at the EUI over time. And we can see that um, each campus has, has goals that are reducing the energy use intensity. And this is tied back to the actions that 
the board took earlier in this meeting when we talked about energy envelope and having more efficient buildings, those things will improve our energy use intensity over time. Um, you see a little bit of an uptick in some of those dark dots that are plotted in 2021. And that was part of a result of us coming back from the pandemic a little bit, and having more utilization of buildings, but we'd expect those to decline over time. If we go to the next slide, um, we look at greenhouse gas emissions. And this is also relative, this also puts it in perspective relative to what the state of Colorado's goals are for greenhouse gas emissions. So by 2025, a 26% reduction, and by 2030, a 50% reduction. Uh, you can see that our campuses have um, goals that range between 40 and 71 percent, depending on um, circumstance by 2026. And again, we, we report on this annually to the board. If we go to the next slide, this is another way to illustrate that concept. And this looks at um, just the metric tons of CO2 over our gross square footage. And you can see that reduction over time. Again, the uptick that you see in 2022, around that time frame, as a result of coming back from the pandemic, um, but we'd expect to make progress over time towards that goal. Um, when we look at um, fa facility condition index, that that is a, a metric by which we say what is the fit and finish and just kind of the age of the infrastructure, but that ties into deferred maintenance. So all of that conversation that we had in the capital construction section for our state funded capital request list for, for Guggenheim and the Strauss Library at, a or at Anschutz, the economics building renovation, um, the Mackey renovation, all of those are tied to us improving our deferred or eliminating deferred maintenance. The four capital or the three of the four capital projects that were just approved removed some of our deferred maintenance at Boulder, and that improves our facility condition index, would ultimately, ultimately impacts our EUI and our greenhouse gas emissions, improving us in both of those places. So in terms of transitioning from what those acute strategic plan goals are, campuses have other actions as well. There's a waste diversion for composting, recycling, renewable energy production. We saw that in some of the charts that um, the Boulder campus had up earlier in terms of solar panels in some of their buildings. Um, we're trying to use water more efficiently. We have a high performance building program. We also have student learning opportunities and community engagement. Um, if we go to the next slide, this is just other general stuff that the university does to promote sustainability. So campuses either have or are in the process of developing um, campus sustainability plans. And those are in varying levels of development with one completed at UCCS in 2022 and other campuses planning to complete those next year in 2024. Um, we know that the state and federal government are making efforts to make it more financially viable for us to invest in these green technologies. So we had a reference earlier in one of the projects to the Federal Inflation Reduction Act. That's going to provide opportunities to invest in our infrastructure, um, not only improving buildings and efficiencies, but EV charging stations and solar arrays. Um, there was also legislation that passed at the state level in Colorado in 2021, where any project in excess of $500,000 has to follow a more um, green footprint in terms of materials it sources to construct buildings. Um, and then when we talk about what we actually do, um, just behavior wise, we, we continually on the facility side, look for ways at the campuses to transition our fleet from gas powered vehicles to more sustainable options, whether those are buses, golf carts, or fleet vehicles, um, transitioning to battery powered grounds equipment to reduce emissions related to um, you know, mowers and things of that nature. And campuses have self-supporting um, um, efforts in this space. The Green Action Fund at UCCS, a sustainable campus program at the AHEC campus, uh, the Colorado Consortium for Climate Change and Health at Anschutz, which studies how health and climate change um, collide and what, what, what impact that has on individuals' health, as well as the Green Lab programs at CU Boulder, which has diverted and saved roughly 360,000 pounds of lab waste. Um, behaviors that we continue on, we have a number of academic offerings where we discuss how to be more sustainable. And you can see all of those uh, listed at the campuses. What do we do in terms of how we conduct our business? We have hybrid work modality for some of our non-student facing roles 
and that's removing a car from the road in terms of commuting. What we're doing right now in terms of having this meeting over Zoom likely cut down on somebody's travel time to drive to a meeting. Um, in addition to that, the PSC, the Procurement Service Center, uh, works with the campuses to try to prioritize, prioritize those places where we spend money and do that in such a way where we can do bulk purchases that cut down on delivery time. So thinking about our climate footprint and that nature too, for, for through that lens as well. Um, and then circling this back to some of the comments that we made about construction throughout the meeting, um, we, we not only invest in trying to be more efficient, but we are also taking steps through our design review board and other, other facets like at the Boulder campus to have sustainability be a key component of what we look at to evaluate opportunities to, to retrofit buildings or build new buildings that are more efficient and more sustainable in nature. Um, we mentioned the, the 60 plus lead certified buildings and that $466 million of green funds, green bonds rather. Um, so that's noted there as well as um, different campus efforts to improve efficiency, including the CU Anschutz uh, project, which designated its first fully electric net zero building um, a couple of years ago in 2021. Um, and then finally, all of these things we approve, what we do, how we conduct our business to achieve our mission at CU, um, these are places where we have a tangible impact on sustainability in the state and the globe as a whole. Um, and these are these are a lot of these tied to our footprint in terms of our buildings, where we are actually reducing and can quantify the number of greenhouse gas emissions in terms of metric tons that we're reducing over time. And some of those are noted here. Um, the other things that are noted here are our um, improvements in just terms of our energy. Um, so um, one of those we had at the Boulder campus earlier, we've also had energy projects at UCCS at the August Finance Committee meeting, as well as a prior bundled energy project at the Anschutz campus. Um, so with that, I just wanted to round out this conversation with the things that we actually do on a day-to-day -day basis to make an impact to try to be more sustainable at CU. And these are, these are those high-level examples that we have. And that takes us through the four segments of presentation for this informational item. So we'll pause here and see if folks have questions. Any questions for the speakers, for Chad, Usha, Dan, anyone? Okay. Well, I just want to say thank you to everyone that participated. Oh, Leslie, you've got something. You're on mute. Thanks to everyone that um, presented. Um, Dan, I have a question. Uh, that one slide that you showed. Am I reading it correctly where at this point we only have 3% um, of our investments in um, oil and gas? Well, let's see, it's the energy sector. Um, and yeah, that was, that's right. As of at the end of June, we're at 3% in the energy sector. This is measured by looking at every one of our mutual funds and our separately managed bond accounts and well, all of our assets, including our money market funds to uh, pull out what is in the energy sector. Okay, so um, yeah. even smaller, I'm sorry, was somebody gonna say something? No, no go ahead. Um, so it seems, you know, it's quite small. Um, given my background, I would, you know, definitely support divestment, but I don't think there's the appetite for the board to do so. Um, so the flip side would be, as I um, kept advocating for during the various presentations, is to be more aggressive on our um, timelines matching the states. And then, um, you know, as much as we can electrify and using clean energy, um, I would be all for that. Um, you know, it's interesting having the two different presentations because in some ways it's sort of like dueling banjos. Um, Nick said that the oil and gas industry um, rebounded after um, the invasion uh, of Ukraine, whereas Tom showed the share of S&P, how um, oil and gas has decreased and then, you know, had that little blip. But uh, anyways, um, 
I appreciate the presentations and um, I just feel like um, if we're not gonna divest, then at the very least we should be as aggressive as we can. You know, obviously we have constrained budgets with not very much funding from the state, but um, just trying to move more and more towards a, a clean energy CU system. So thank you. Thank you, Leslie. Ken? Leslie, you spawned a, a question for me, so I appreciate that. Um, Dan, in the energy sector, do we have any sustainable companies or is that part of energy? Is there any sustainability within the energy sector that we invest in? <laughs> That's a great question. In the, in the uh, sustainability world index, there are about uh, 13 energy companies that are in there. Um, I don't think we hold any of those. I've never, I didn't recognize their names. We would have to do a deeper dive to really see if there's any crossover there. Um, but I do, there, there's, a, I have seven pages list of all the companies that are in that index. They change every year. Um, they have to apply to, to, uh, to that in, index. And, um, it's a very uh, strenuous process to do their assessment and companies go in and out mm -hmm. uh, depending on that assessment. Um, but I, uh, yeah, I don't know the answer to your question. I, I, I don't think so though. <laughs> okay. Any, any further questions for anyone on the panel today? Okay, seeing none, I just want to thank everyone. Uh, we got through a, a lot of information on the first part of our our agenda, and and this last hour was really very interesting. And I want to thank our speakers, uh, Nick and Tom, for joining us, and for everyone that has submitted um, comments on this subject. Uh, thank you for all the time and and effort you've put into that. And as I said earlier. All of those written comments will be uh, loaded up uh, through board docs as well. So um, thanks everyone for joining us. Our next meeting is scheduled for January 26th. And um, I just wanna thanks, thank again, all of our staff who put lots of time into preparing uh, today's, today's meeting. So thanks, thanks again to everyone.